Hello everyone. We're going to do a lecture today on the hematopoietic drugs. It's not that long of a lecture. It's not that bad. A lot of it's going to be review for pathophys. So, um, I'll, and I'll highlight the slides, you know, not to worry about for, for my class for testing purposes. So speaking of causes of anemia, um, this is again, just review for pathophysiology. Um, a lot of times I put these slides in here just to give the kind of complete picture and it's some it's I found that it's helped students in the past um, But don't stress about this as far as testing purposes for my course um, I won't be testing you guys on um, just pure pathophysiology For example this slide, but definitely read through it um, And I think it's a good review and it's, it seemed like in the again in the past has helped students kind of um, Reinforce some of the things that you'll hear in pathophys Classification um, by MCV, again, just read through that. Etiology, again, read through this. Um, I won't be pulling test questions from here specifically, but um, this will probably help you with some of the drugs and um, it may help with some me mechanism of actions, et cetera. So, so go ahead and read through it. Um, I, th I think it's good, but you'll notice too, it even says pathophysiology there. Microcytic anemia, again, just, you know, no basic definitions, um, but not for testing purposes for my course. Same thing with macrocytic and normocytic. Again, just read through these slides, but um, but don't worry about heavy test questions from, from my course. All right, so this is where we will pull some test questions from. This is a good list of the drugs. Um, and then definitely, again, like I've said before, um, pay attention to how it's classified here. Um, because this is a classification that I'll expect you guys to know. Iron. So first of all, you guys probably already have maybe had this in pathophys, but um, just basic overview um, that iron is important um, specifically for the hemoglobin and myoglobin. Um, and then it's also involved in with the cytochrome enzymes, so from a drug metabolism in the liver. So overall, very important, and this is why we have to supplement it if there, a patient isn't getting enough for a number of different reasons. And here are some of the reasons for iron deficiency anemia. Um, again, just read through these, and um, and let's see. So I think it's good to, to read through this, like I said, um, and look at the discussion here. Um, again, don't stress too much about test questions coming from here, but like for example, NSAIDs, we will talk about these later during the pain module, um, and so those can result in uh, GI bleeding, ulcers, etc., and may cause um, some blood loss, and so um, I think it's important, and then too, like with the ob module, pregnancy lactation, um, you know, there's some increased utilization there, um, so it's a good idea to just read through this now, and that we'll be revisiting these um, as we go through the semester. So like I said, sometimes you need to supplement with iron. Um, there's oral and parenteral, which is IV. Um, so typically IV is going to be inpatient and for the very, very severe iron deficiency. So you won't see that as much. Um, you guys will probably be prescribing and seeing a lot more of the oral preparations. And they make a few of those. So, so read through those and make sure you're familiar with all the different types that they make. Um, and I do want you to actually pay attention to and memorize which ones are oral versus which ones are IV. Um, you'll you'll notice too, like with the ferrous gluconate and then ferric gluconate, uh, make sure you keep those straight. But um, but please pay attention, and I want you guys to know for testing purposes which ones are oral and then which ones are parenteral. Adverse effects. This is important. Definitely put a star by this slide. I, I want you guys to know about this. Um, one thing I want to highlight here first off is um, unfortunately a acute iron toxicity is still a problem here in the U.S. Um, because of children's multivitamins. So um, there's been some put or there's been some um, response by the manufacturers and so they've stopped making a lot of the really delicious candy-like multivitamins. So I don't know if you guys are familiar but like I grew up with Flintstones kids for example um, and those had iron in it um, so unfortunately that was something that could lead to iron toxicity because so basically the the situation goes that a kid gets into these delicious tasting multivitamins and they have um, iron in them and then there's an iron toxicity. So um, so you'll notice, and you can still find these, unfortunately they, they aren't as popular as they once were and so a lot of the kids' vitamins will be iron free. You'll see that, so it'll be like the gummy vitamins that look like candy um, and they're 
you know, iron free. However, they make <laughs> gummy vitamins and candy like vitamins for adults that do have iron. Um, and so, yes, the label says iron free, but you know, you get a toddler, like, so like my daughter can't really read, you know, three, four year olds can't necessarily read. So if, if, you know, if a young one were to get into it and it looks like candy, um, then, you know, it's something where it's, they weren't going to read, oh, is this for kids or this is for adults, you know? So unfortunately that is something that, um, is still an issue. And then definitely I want you guys to memorize and, and to know for testing purposes, the antidote here is deferoxamine. Um, part of the reason I highlight that is because you will see a lot of these antidotes on your board questions. And so, um, and so because of that, I, I include them in my test questions. And I just did a quick Google search here. So gummy vitamins with iron, um, they sell them at Target, they have them on Amazon, etc. So again, they maybe only be for women's or they're women's one a day, but um, they look like candy, which I, I kind of, I wish they didn't make them even for adults. I'm kind of like, Hey, you're an adult. You can take a vitamin that doesn't taste like candy, but, but anyways, I won't, won't get on my soapbox there or anything. But, um, so anyway, so this is a big reason why, um, there is still an issue with the toxicity, unfortunately. Um, so again, just please note that, um, and then please note the antidote for that. Other than that too, um, I also want you guys to pay attention to acute toxicity. Um, so GI, upset, so diarrhea with bleeding, GI irritation with bleeding, nausea, so definitely cast, um, classify all of those as uh, GI upset. Also related is the uh, vomiting with blood and then green tarry stools. And the green tarry stools can actually happen, or rather discoloration of, of your stools can happen even when you don't have toxicity. So that is something that um, in the pharmacy we warn people about if they're taking iron preparations, it may discolor your you know feces and stuff and don't, not to be freaked out about it, but it's also a sign of, a sign of toxicity. Um, so all of these, these first ones here, you lump together and kind of think about as GI adverse effects or GI upset. So it is something that, um, they've made some different formulations to try to be less harsh on the, the stomach, but unfortunately, um, it is something that you still have to be concerned with when you're taking these, especially higher doses in the longer term. Um, and then you, also, too, with that toxicity, acute toxicity, you have to be worried about hepatic failure and then metabolic acidosis. So so definitely highlight those, pay attention to those. Um, and then it's interesting. So if a, a child took a bottle of these or whatever, or an adult intentionally or unintentionally ingested a whole bunch, um, this is kind of a fun fact that their radio tablets are radiopaque. So on an x-ray, they light up. They, they're, there'll be a brighter white. Um, so you could see then if a person, let's say they're unconscious or whatever, you weren't sure what they got into, or if it's a, if it's a child and they're unable to talk or kind of express themselves fully, the x-ray can be useful. But just FYI, I just thought that was interesting. <laughs> chronic toxicity. So the chronic toxicity is more of a rare disorder. So for example, with hemo, hemochromatosis, um, this is actually a genetic disease that's, uh, that's pretty rare, autosomal recess recessive. Um, that causes um, increased absorption of iron in the small intestines. Then the hemosiderosis is something that happens. Um, it's an iron overload usually secondary to something. So for example, if someone got um, has an excessive blood transfusion, so if, if they had sickle cell disease, for example. Um, and then there's also um, some idiopathic forms too that um, you'll probably talk about more in, in some of the other um, pathophys and ICM. Um, and then two, please note that there is a box warning. So there... Um, there can be an anaphylactic type reaction that can be reported, and it's unfortunately it's it's rare, but it's it's one of those unpredictable kind of you know you don't know what's going to happen. Um, and that's especially with the iron dextrin complex. So this is another reason too why the oral is preferred, um, and that the IV are typically um, reserved for for more severe um, for more severe use. And the part of the box warning too is that so there's actually two box warnings for the iron dextrin complex. Um, the one is for the anaphylactic type reactions, um, which basically describes that there have been fatalities uh, follow the administration of the iron dextrin injection, and that you're supposed to make sure anytime you do give it, you have recita re recitation equipment and, pers and personnel that's trained to, um, to detect the anaphylactic type reaction and then how to, you know, respond to it pr appropriately. So you don't have to stress too much about that because um, in your inpatient facilities and stuff, they should have protocols and everyone should be aware of this and all the other staff, nurses, physicians, et cetera, should be aware of this um, and that, uh, but anyways, and then also related to that, there have been, um, there is a part of this, part of the strategy is to administer a test dose of the iron dextrin 
prior to the first therapeutic dose. Um, and then if there are no signs and symptoms of anaphylactic type reaction, um, then you can go ahead and administer the full therapeutic dose. Um, but then it's something that you need to, anytime you administer it, even if a person has passed the test dose, you still need to monitor them for the anaphylactic type reaction. Um, and then unfortunately, fatal reactions have occurred, again, more rare, but they have occurred with even the test dose. Um, and so um, they happen with the test dose, and then they sometimes fatal reactions have happened after they pass the test dose, and then they're being given it, and then they have maybe second, third dose, then they have the anaphylactic type reaction. Um, so that's something to, to always note and, and definitely pay attention to with the iron dextrin complex. And, and like I said, too, in the hospital, they'll probably have a protocol and have everything kind of lined out for you guys. So you don't have to stress too much that you'll, you know, uh, well, what do I do with this iron dextrin? Um, the other thing to note, too, is that patients with a history of drug allergy or multiple drug allergies may be at an increased risk of having a hypersensitivity uh, anaphylactic type reaction um, to the iron dextrin. So that's the other thing. The second box warning they have that the FDA placed on there is, is a quote unquote appropriate use. Um, and again, this kind of goes back to what I said that these IV preparations aren't usually first line, um, but that it's, the, the wording goes that you should use iron dextrin only in patients in whom clinical and laboratory investigations have established are an iron deficient state, not amendable by oral iron therapy. So again, the FDA is even recognizing and putting in their box warning that you should, if you can give the oral iron, that is a preferred treatment. So, so anyway, so hopefully that's that's clear. And definitely note that. All right, changing gears here a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about folic acid and vitamin B12. Um, and then again, you know, kind of review from pathophys and from your bio class. It's important why, you know, the reasons why folic acid and vitamin B12 are important. Um, neutrophils, um, again, just FYI from, from my course. Uh, this may help with, with pathophys. Um, this is also FYI for my course. It just shows the um, why folate and B12 are important for DNA synthesis. But, um, you know, I don't worry, don't stress about this for my class as far as me testing you on this cascade. All right, another FYI si slide, the functions of folic acid. So just, you know, read through that. Don't stress about it for my class. And continued here, um, FYI here, um, but go ahead and pay attention to these drugs here and go ahead and read these. We will be seeing methotrexate later in the um, arthritis. We talk about arthritis and then when we talk about uh, chemotherapy, but because it's used for both anti-cancer and for rheumato RA, rheumatoid arthritis. The trimethoprim we already talked about in the antimicrobial section, so um, just refer to that, but you know that it can have some effects on folic acid. And then the Pyrethamine, it will also talk about in the antimicrobials, and that one is related. It's a protozoal, antiprotozoal. Um, it's a malarial treatment or adjunct to malaria. So, um, again, can have some implications for folic acid. Dietary folate. Uh, most of this is FYI. Just please note here that alcohol and then the oral contraceptive pill, so this is a birth control, um, can inhibit the absorption of, of dietary folate. So that's something that's going to implications for uh, people who are uh, chronic, uh, chronic alcoholics um, and something that I had some experience with when I worked at the psych facility in San Antonio. We had a lot of uh, detox patients, and so we'd always send them the folic acid and, um, and thiamine were the other ones. So we sent them this vitamin pack uh, because they were chronic alcoholics. And then with oral contraceptives, we'll talk about a lot more in the ob gyn module. Um, but just real quick, just to note that they do make some oral, they make some um, oral contraceptive pills that are combined with a, some type of, of folate or folic acid. Um, and so because oral contraceptives can sometimes um, block the absorption of those. So, um, but like I said, we'll talk about that more later. Um, and again, just this is a more FYI slide. Just know that there are implications if you're not um, ingesting enough vitamin B12, and that you know vitamin B12 is important for um, some of the normal cell process. It's causes of folate deficiency. Um, read through this. Um, I won't be pulling s test questions from this explicitly. Um, you know, other than it would be good to know these drug these drug interactions here. So go ahead and just look at those. You will see these more later on. Um, I, I mean, we talked about the antimicrobial during this module, but um, but later on you'll see some of these other ones. So just good to, to kind of remember these for, for future reference. This is again FYI slide. Um, I'm not going to 
quiz you on, but I believe Dr. Faruqi will for the pathophysiology. Again, FYI from, from my course, just go ahead and read through that. Um, this is also FYI, um, and just again, read through it. It probably will help with, uh, with pathophysiology. It may, it may be with, maybe help with ICM as well. Um, another FYI for, for pharmacology, just read through this. Another slide, FYI, um, for my course. This one too, just read through it again, maybe will help in pathophysiology. The other th only thing to note here for pharmacology is that it is given once a month if a person cannot. So the B B12 will be given once a month. So they have injections um, that they'll do once a month uh, who cannot absorb it from their diet. So this is again, just pretty much FYI. Um, I'd read through it again. There's some good stuff on here, but um, just one thing to note, I, depending on your patient population in Austin, when I was a, a pharmacy student in Austin, we come across this, but uh, pure vegans. So if you don't, if you don't have any animal products, so this, um, this includes, you know, you're not eating any eggs, drinking any milk, et cetera, um, let alone consuming meat, um, that they can develop vitamin B12 deficiency. So if you ever come across a patient who is a pure vegan or a true kind of hardcore um, vegan, which again, not to, I'm not picking on Austin or anything, but I came across more vegan patients in um, Austin than I have in South Texas or in, in Oklahoma where I worked. Um, you'll, you'll come across them every once in a while, but, but anyways, and so just make sure you're thinking about their, um, their vitamin B12 anytime you, um, and the same thing too for board questions, there will be, um, they will talk about someone having a restricted diet or they don't eat any animal products or whatever. And that should be a red flag then to be like, oh, well that's, um, you know, that's associated with B12. Um, plus these other things too. So definitely look at, look at these. Test for vitamin B12 deficiency. Um, just read through it. This will come and help. And I believe Dr. Faruqi asks questions about this, but, um, but not for me. Folate preparations. Okay, so these I do want, you know, for pharmacy. Let's put an RX up here. Folic acid and covarin, which is folinic acid. So the folic acid can help with megaloblastic and microcytic anemias. Um, and then like iron, it's when you have a folate deficiency. So pretty straightforward, not super complex. And then the other thing too, it is good for, um, for pregnant mothers or women that are planning on becoming pregnant to have a prenatal vitamin. So um, that's something I come across with the lay public in the pharmacy that sometimes um, the patient population, you'll notice the patient populations and, and some of my family members are the same way. Like you don't take prenatal vitamins until you're pregnant. Um, but it's actually, it's in the, in the name. So prenatal means before, you know, pre means before. So, um, if, a, if you know of a woman, uh, or have a patient or a family member that is planning or quote unquote, trying to get pregnant, that, um, it wouldn't hurt for them to start their prenatals before they actually have, they conceive. Um, so, so anyway, so that's just something that is interesting. Just, you know, with, my over-the-counter experience with with patients folinic acid so this one is it's got some niche uses so um, definitely please note here that it's an antidote for folic acid antagonists we have those listed there so i'd like you to know that um, it's also used as a rescue therapy um, in chemotherapy after a high dose methotrexate so what happens is, and um, we'll talk about the uses of methotrexate with chemotherapy but basically methotrexate is given for chemotherapy and it's just again something that's known that it depletes your folic acid, right? Or that it affects folic acid. And so this will be prescribed to be given 24 hours after the beginning of the methotrexate infusion. Um, and then it's usually continued every six to six hours for 10 doses. Um, and then you keep using it until the methotrexate level is less than 0 0.05 micromolars. Um, so that's something that you'll see depending on where you work. Um, so with pharmacists are similar to PAs in the sense and physicians too, that with the chemotherapy, it's really depends on where you work, if you're going to see this or not. Um, so with, you know, with pharmacists, it's, there's usually kind of like specialist pharmacists that work at specialty specialty pharmacies, um, who deal with this, but, but anyways, just, you may still see this on your boards and, um, may still come, come up and then depending on where you end up practicing, you may see it or may not. So and it's kind of interesting. I've had some questions before in the past was by students, but um, basically the way it works is that, um, so the folinic acid is basically a reduced form of folic acid. And um, so the 
Coverin supplies the necessary cofactor blocked by methotrexate. Um, and the Lucuveron actively competes with methotrexate for transport sites, displaces mexotrexate, mexotrexate from intracellular binding sites, and restores active folate stores required for DNA-RNA synthesis. It also um, works, and it actually enhances the activity of the fluor fluorouracil, which you'll notice here. So it, it's kind of a synergistic, or, or potentiates rather, so it kind of it boosts that when it's used for, um, for treatment of in chemotherapy or for colon cancer, for example. Um, and then it's also given in combination with a pyrethamine um, for the treatment of opportunistic infections. Um, and then when it's given in combination, it helps reduce the risk of the hematologic toxicities of the pyrethamine. So it's again kind of syner synergistic and can kind of help when it's given in combination with that. It can also help with uh, megaloblastic anemias. Um, so nymphacy and SPRU is just another name for the celiac disease in pregnancy. Um, and then it, it's not first line, but so if a person for whatever reason cannot have oral um, folic acid, then it would be, you know, you could go to this um, as second line. Now we have a couple vitamin B12, the cyanocobalamin and the hydroxocobalamin. Cyanocobalamin, so this one um, can help with anemia, so pernicious anemia specifically. Um, and then uh, maybe added when someone has a uh, during neoplastic treatment and then anytime that someone needs supplementation so um, i mentioned the pure vegan but then there's some other other instances too where you may see it being used or there may be indications for it and then the hydroxocobalamin again pernicious anemia um, it's used as a diagnostic agent for the Schilling test, so um, so know that for me, but then don't stress too much about the Schilling test. I, I believe you'll see that in um, pathophysiology, but definitely star this. I want you guys to know that this is the treatment of choice for cyanide poisoning, um, so so know that, please. And it basically it blind, binds to the cyanide and helps it eliminate via the urine, um, so it's, it's good for that. All right, changing gears here a little bit, going to the hematopoietic growth factors. So just read through this, the hematopoietic growth factors, what they do. Um, and then here you'll notice this last section here on this table that is um, showing anemia due to bone marrow failure. So here's some drugs that can help with that bone marrow, bone marrow failure. So here's the list here. So first one we have the erythropoietin, which epitein alpha or darbopoietin alpha. So you can classify those together. Um, these both st basically stimulate red blood cell production. So a, couple, a few different uses here. So cancer, you may see it in cancer patients, people that's receiving chemotherapy um, who need that boost in RBC production, chronic renal failure, and then people with AIDS maybe. Um, this is also this abbreviated EPO, and um, you may have seen in um, with the Tour de France or whatever, I think, I think, I don't know if it was Lance Armstrong or not. Sorry, sorry, Lance, if it wasn't you. But so what this is... Um, sometimes referred to as blood doping. Um, and so this is where you can boost the number of red blood cells in the bloodstream to increase the athletic performance. Um, so that's kind of interesting too. I don't know who first has <laughs> discovered that, but the idea is that the, uh, the blood cells carry oxygen from the lungs to the muscles and then higher concentrations in the blood can improve the athletics, the athletes, I'm sorry, aerobic capacity and endurance. Um, so, um, it is illegal and I don't recommend it for you guys or, um, you know, if you come across younger, younger patients, younger athletes, high school athletes, college athletes as your patients, um, definitely discourage the, that use of that. Um, and the reason why is because it, long-term the adverse effects include, um, increasing the blood viscosity. Um, and then, so if a person were to overdose on it or, um, you know, take too much, they can increase the risk of heart attack, stroke pulmonary embolism. Um, so, you know, it can, um, can have some problems too. And then too, if you're getting drugs illegally, you don't know the quality or, or what exactly you're taking, etc. But, but anyway, so yeah, don't do drugs, kids. No. <laughs> Sargramacin, which the brand name is Leukine, um, which is a little bit easier to say. And I hear people refer to it as that. Um, mainly it's going to be something that you're going to see with chemotherapy. So not commonly prescribed and it's kind of kind of niche medicine but mainly um you know for cancer patients and then maybe for for aids patients so we have filgrostim and peg filgrostim 
Also, both um, granulocyte colony stimulating factors, um, again, used for um, in chemotherapy or so for cancer patients. Oprelvican, which the brand name, they don't know how to make it, it's generic only, but it was Numega, which was easier. To it sounds kind of cool too, like some kind of superhero or something, but it's N-E-U-M-E-G-A, Numega. Um, like I said, they no longer make the brand name, but you still hear that people refer to it as that. Um, but again, pretty niche use. Um, just read through this, but chemotherapy-induced thrombocytopenia, et cetera. But, so you typically for your chemotherapy. And this one is, um, just FYI, recombinant human interleukin 11, so IL-11. And then here is another great table. Definitely put a star by this side. Make sure you guys look through this. Good summary table. Has the drugs listed here. Um, mechanism of action. Summarized. And it's good. I like that. And clinical applications, adverse effects, and contraindications. So please look at all those. And you'll notice too, hypersensitivity. See for everything. Um, so want you to have that stereotype for all these drugs, but then look at the specific ones too, as far as their contraindications. I put a couple summary of important points on this. So there's a couple, yeah, two, oops, two slides. Um, and I did that just because it seemed in the past I had students request this from me, but um, just go ahead and read through them. Um, don't stress too much again about this. This is more, um, a review and will help you probably with more with ICM pathophysiology. So um, I hopefully did a good job of highlighting the slides I want you guys to pay attention to and, and the points I want you guys to pay attention to. So um, pretty quick presentation, not a ton of stuff in here, um, but and some things we're going to be revisiting later on. So um, so hopefully you guys are pretty clear on, on which slides here to focus, focus on. All right. Thank you guys for your attention. I uh, will talk to you guys later. Bye.